delighted to welcome to the Design Notes studio today the designer of Titanic, Sagrada, and the new last podcast on the left game, Daryl Andrews. Daryl, welcome to the Design Notes studio. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. So, uh, we rarely in life get to be unapologetically self-regarding, but this is an opportunity for you. So I'm going to ask you this question and feel free to brag as much as possible. So uh, when did you know you were good at what you do? Ugh. Uh, this is like very against the grain of a Canadian <laughs> <laughs> to brag. It's uh, It's been uh, whittled out of us, I think. Uh, but, um, you know... I, I do I do think I uh, I'm probably not better than anyone in one particular thing, but I do think I'm I'm strong in a bunch of things. So I, I like to think, you know, I, I'm pretty strong with things like math, and that comes in handy for board game design. I, I'm pretty good people person. Uh, you know, I have a background with some education in psychology and um, kind of like understanding and being able to read a room. I was I was a prison guard, so I really had to. Uh, be able to read the room and uh, watch body language. And, and so all those things, I think, make me really good at watching play tests or even pitching a game and kind of reading, you know, a publisher's reaction and see what they're interested in. And then I like to think I'm, I'm pretty creative, too. So uh, I think that blending helps me, you know, I, I, I can think of a, a ton of designers that are better at me at each of those things, but I have a nice blend and so I, I think that's my, what I bring to the table is uh, that mix of math, art, and psychology. And you recently won an award for the last podcast on the left game. I mean, what's that like? Is it, is it weird standing on a podium and receiving an award? Yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, first of all, completely unexpected. I say to people, I would have paid for a haircut. Uh, if I thought I was going to go on stage, <laughs> um, I didn't even bring my wife with me to the award show because there were 13 people um, that were nominated for the taggy. Uh, this was a couple months ago and, and it's a full, like people are in gowns and tuxedos and here's this schlub who mostly wears a hat most of the time and uh, was sitting shocked that I was even in the room. I was sitting at a table that was sponsored and and it was all Disney executives at my table. And and yet, uh, lo and behold, I got the award for Innovator of the Year uh, with uh, getting to work, especially with Goliath on The Real Truth with the last podcast on the left. And, and I, I legitimately lost my mind on the way up to the stage. I blanked. I, I, did, I, I didn't believe when I watched people on you know, award shows say that they they were speechless. And then I was that guy. I was up there just, I don't even know what I said. I had to watch a video afterwards just to even know. So yeah, it was a complete surprise for me. And sort of what are the, what are the um, after effects of winning an award like that? Does it, does it help with getting further work? I mean, is there, is there money attached to it? All of that sort of thing. Yeah, I wish there were money attached. That'd be great. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, I guess in theory, uh, more sales of games uh, is is a real practical way. Um, I do think definitely more doors. I mean, even since winning that award, I've had some great conversations with different publishers that just reached out, either like through LinkedIn or email, or even you know uh, just just found me on social media. So. It, it, it's more opportunity. It doesn't mean necessarily more work, but at least it's, you know, lead generation. Um, and I don't know yet, too. Like, a part of me is like, this is the year of let's hope that opens a few more doors or that gives me a, a foot in the door to encourage, especially bigger companies to consider me. And so, you know, what got you from a person who just plays games to standing on a stage receiving an award for a design of your own. Sure. I mean, winning that really got me thinking about that um, and just the journey. And it's, it's interesting because from the beginning, you know, I was a, I was a board gamer at heart. I, I loved games as a chance to connect with people, to tell stories, to, 
escape to you know try things out i love puzzliness and the cleverness of games and so i just dabbled mostly in organizing events and connecting people with games anything from you know strategy board games to poker tournaments to you name it uh had a in college a a risk league that we kept stats like you name it I, i i i've loved games and then I started dabbling in design and again it to me was just a it wasn't a job it was it was like a hobby that I was kind of turning into a job a jobby I you know that I I enjoyed uh as again a side hustle and it was later where my wife gave me the green light to say hey why don't you chase that why don't you try doing some design why don't you go to some conventions and introduce yourself to some people and pitch some of those ideas that you have. So that that's really where it started. And it, it took a number of years for even the first few games to get signed and get out there, but then it kind of snowballed. So, I mean, it's often you see a designer will have a design that makes a splash and then you see them having an incredible output in the next couple of years. Is that just because you've spent so long designing so much stuff that when you actually get published it's just it's just sort of like a tap turned on and all of that stuff you've worked on previously just gets released yeah I, I i think there's definitely some logic to that and i i also just think there there's almost a momentum like once you get that first game signed then there's like a trust and an interest that publishers are like oh okay well if you have one out there maybe we'll take a flyer on you like they're there's almost a cred check. And so I think, um, like I think back, like I, I had been hitting, I still do a lot of conventions, but when I started, I just kept trying to like leverage one convention to the next one, to the next one. And I probably also was burning the candle from both ends because I would cram as many pitch meetings in as I could. I remember, I remember coming out of conventions and being like, yeah, I did 40, 50 meetings. And people would go, what? You don't need to do that many. That's crazy. And uh, so I think even that, like some of it is like the zeal and hunger of like hitting the pavement, doing the hustle, getting in front of as many people. I think early on, um, you know, designers are hungry. And then maybe we get a little complacent or a little uh, lazier on our pitches and, and, and don't pitch as many. So we slow down a bit. And, you know, it, there are jobs that people consider sort of real, proper jobs where you get up in the morning and you put on a suit and you go into an office or you, you go to a factory and you, you build things. Do you ever have a moment where you're sort of sat and you think, my God, this is my job. Isn't this surreal? Oh, yeah. Oh, all the time. And it's, it's hard because you have to push through those walls to force you to put in the time, to force you to put in the work and to try to build rhythms and patterns because it is so weird it is very you have to be self-motivated you have to be disciplined and it and it's great but it also can be kind of a scary kind of imposter syndrome moment so i like i i like for instance i love co-design and so a lot of the times like i'll really try to schedule like oh this is a day that i meet with this person or or this you know, these are the projects I need to work on because I have this play test coming up or this meeting about that. And so those different kind of uh, deadlines or restraints really help help me drive or think of it as a normal job, but it, it still is very weird. And it's, it's kind of like whenever I meet people in a social setting, you know, it's the cool job initially when you say what you do for your living. And then it's like, wait, what do you do? Like, there's, <laughs> is that real? And I didn't, I didn't think it was real when I was a kid. I never would have thought being a game designer was a possible job. So I get it. And it's kind of fun to be like, you know, at a work event for my wife or something and people meet me and then like I become the, the fun guy to talk to. So I, I, I'll take it. And, you know, so many jobs, you sort of go to university to train to do that job, you leave your university and you get that job. Whereas game design, almost all game designers I've spoken to have had many, many jobs before they managed to get the momentum to earn 
the money to be able to do game design full time. And I mean, I think when I got back into ga- when I got into gaming in sort of 2012, there were almost no full time game designers. So I mean, and you've done a lot. Were there any skills from your previous life that you brought into the designing that, that helped you? Yeah, no, I I, I do kind of look back and see like the kind of little things here or there that kind of wired me. I mean, I mentioned like the prison guard experience of like people watching, but, uh, you know, I was a, a pastor and for a number of years, like just trying to understand people, listen to people, you know, see what drives people, what motivates. I think I've done, I've done jobs, anything from like working in restaurants or uh, working in, in retail where again, you, you learn about what makes people tick, you know, sales jobs help you significantly with cutting, cutting to the chase and trying to like, you know, really see what's going to motivate someone. And, 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 uh, so I, I think lots of those, I think even just like a lot of, when I look back, like hobbies or, or things that I've, I've done over the years have, have really kind of made me think about games and subjects and you know one thing i point to for instance is even travel so the places that i've been have really become like spots that i try to grab inspiration from so if that's you know anything from i visited the sagrada familia to you know even just like visiting museums or talking to friends that are passionate on different subject matters they all they all seem to kind of translate. Like I kind of say like inspiration can come from anywhere. Um, you know, I, I, w- I wrote uh, reviews for movies uh, and would like interview people for like the Toronto Film Festival. And yet now, like I think, you know, I love movies for just like potential starting off spots for games. So they, they, they all kind of weave together, but you just you kind of don't see it forming until it does. So can you give us an overview then of your game design process from, you know, getting the idea to it being a game on the table that I can lose at? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, the I wish I had like a really set process, uh, but I can talk to a few and see, you know, most of the time it's when inspiration hits, I become a madman uh, and just like try to jot down and, and make something. It might my wife, I joke, like, I always go like, oh, I have an idea. And then she'll be like, okay, let's hear it. And uh, I just need to say it out loud. Like, I just need to, like, get it out of myself. And then, thankfully, she she always graciously listens, but then is like, okay, cool. I don't want to see that for a long time. And so, like, then I work on it. I find a co-designer sometimes. I I get something on the table as fast as possible. And maybe it's just like a few turns usually it crashes and burns but it's like this moment of like hey is this is there something fun here is there something interesting i and and then from there i i continue to reiterate and reiterate and it might stay close to what was the original idea or maybe that's just the launching pad for a better idea but i i think it's really important to to not stew on it too long like chew on it start getting stuff down but get it out on the table as fast as possible so i guess that's that's my process usually pretty quick if the idea kind of like seems like a fit with someone i might contact them and say like hey this is something i'm working on or thinking about do you want to join that um but then usually what happens is i work on it for a bit and then it just fails like there's a real Hmm. like roadblock and that's when I even will just like put it on the shelf. I'll, uh, you know, I kind of think of it as like, I love cooking. And so like sometimes like your, your sauce or your, your, your thing needs to simmer. And so like I put it on the back burner on low, you know, it's, I'm still thinking about it, but I'm not actively like working, working, trying to force it. I, you know, let it marinate, let it stew. And then come back to it when I think, you know, I have a fresh idea, which is probably, you know, from the shower or or somewhere where you're not intentionally thinking about it, where like all of a sudden you have a brainwave. And the same happens with co-designers. Sometimes the co-designer I'm working with goes, oh, 
I think I got a solution or I think I got something we can throw in the mix. And then from there, we continue to, to dabble. So I, I th- at least early stages, that's, that's kind of the first few months. Sometimes just uh, inspiration hits. I, uh, I was joking that uh, I have an upcoming meeting with Floodgate Games and we're, we've been chatting about different things with Sagrada. And, and literally, like, I booked that meeting and ever since I have been just exploding with more Sagrada ideas. And it's just because now it's on the forefront of my mind. Oh, we have this upcoming meeting. So I can't help but now just be like, oh, like, here, here's another idea. And I keep sending stuff to Adrian. And I'm sure Adrian's just like, Daryl, stop. Like, <laughs> you need to work on one of these, not like 10 more ideas. So, yeah. And, and you know, Sagrada is your idea out of your brain, your sort of theming. And so I assume that the, not the design space so much, the idea space is a lot wider and you're more free, whereas you do a lot of IP stuff. Yeah. And also, so, you know, I do creative stuff and I would say at least 60, 70% of the ideas I have never get used. They mm. they come to a certain point and then they, they grind to a halt and then you never use them. Whereas... Yeah an ip game if you sign a contract to make a game i assume you've got to deliver a game so i mean how much do those limitations help refine the process do you think yeah i mean precious you know pressure makes diamonds so sometimes uh yeah you you needing to come up with something but i i will also say there are many times that like we've hit a wall you know and said to a publisher like it's not clicking like do you want to let this go or you know we need more time um that's just a reality because like you said so many ideas don't work out so so it is really uh oh especially with an ip the pressure i hate the pressure at the start of trying to find that click once once you get like onto a, the track of like where you know it's gonna go that's great i love it then it's like Okay, we got pressure and timelines, but we know the direction. But until then, yeah, it, it feels heavy because an IP, like you said, like you're you're signed on and kind of promising to execute. Um, I remember one project that I'll talk about because I, sadly the the company doesn't even exist anymore. But I got hired to do a Space Invaders game and. Um, I was so pumped to get that license that I was an absolute fool and committed to uh, having a game in a month. And uh, because this person was like, yeah, this is the deadline. You need to come back to me with it in a month. And so after week one, I pitched a bunch of ideas and they're like, nope, those suck. Uh, Come back. And I was like, cool. Uh, Time's ticking. And then the second week, I came up with some stuff and they were like, yeah, this is close, but still not right. But uh, just an FYI, we need final rules as well by the end of the month. And I was like, what? I thought I just <laughs> need to like have a general game idea. And they're like, nope, you signed. And so the next two weeks, I, I don't know if I slept those two weeks, but I just kept cramming and working on this game. And, it, you know, it was it was fine. It wasn't like my greatest design by any means, but it was... You know, if I had more time, I wish I, you know, could have made it stronger. But but that just also taught me, like, give yourself a lot more time and flexibility and and be honest about the process. Like um, sometimes now I'll structure deals where it's like the clock starts once we've approved the idea Mm. and things like that. And so I'm learning along the way to give myself a little little more buffer. So, yeah. And so what so you've, you've got this idea, you've put it out as a prototype and it's starting to work when do you know that it's a good design oh you know it's funny um sometimes it just clicks like so for instance like sagrada the reason we knew it was ready to start showing people we we just play test as much as we can like that's our mindset is play test play test play test and if a game seems right the next convention i'm going to you know, bring that out of the bag and and start pitching that, add it to the rotation. And uh, Sagrada had ups and downs. We actually like, it was pretty abstract for a little bit. And then, you know, I went to Barcelona and it really clicked with a theme. So like, 
before that, we didn't even know what the theme was. Um, and then we kept play testing. And it's funny, we realized people started taking their phones at the end of the game and taking a picture. And we were like, what are you doing? Like, this is just a prototype. And they're like, no, but I, I'm proud of what I made. And we were like, oh, that's cool. Like, that's a that's a fun reaction. And so just like that is an example of a moment where the game broke through from just like, hey, I'm convincing my friends to help me out here by playtesting. And now they're just like, like really like into it. Mm -hmm. And so those moments are like what we're watching for. Like when when a play tester says, hey, can we play that again? Or like, hey, I can teach it. Like if you want to run another play test and I'm going to like those are these like checkpoints that we realize like, oh, that's starting to starting to really hum along. And then and then we start pitching it. And the reality is that's our like next check, because pretty quickly on a pub publishers will either like show some interest or they all not. And that that silence will usually be like mm -hmm. a sign of like, oh, we thought it was ready, but it is not. Or it's just never going to work out. Like sometimes it's just like, hey, it works. But, you know, if no one wants it, you know, we got to move on. So. Those are, those are usually some of the moments that we know it's, it's really working. And then, and then we're just wrong sometimes. So, <laughs> and, and so, you know, you've had a lot of games published and I assume you've received a lot of author copies, but what was that first time like when you got the parcel, you opened it and you saw the box with the shrink wrap on it and your name above the title of the game? Oh yeah, it, it was amazing. Uh, the very first game that I received, it was actually the second game I signed. It was a game called Caffeine Rush. It was a card game about battling baristas trying to make espresso fast orders for uh, your customers. And it was published by r, &R Games. A little small compact thing, but I, I, I remember even how I got it was it got showcased at New York Toy Fair and I had a friend at New York Toy Fair and I was like, get a picture with it and then ask for a copy. And I just lost my mind seeing it out in the wild. It was just like, oh, it's real. Like this, like in some ways for me at least, and maybe this is just trying to like, like not get too emotionally attached until it's real and tangible. The game is kind of like, yeah, 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 it's coming, maybe someday. But then once that that physical copy is out there, that's uh, that's a big moment. Every time I think uh, uh, seeing seeing your game in action is it's pretty special. And so getting it or 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 one of my all time favorites, seeing it played. If you can just like accidentally stumble upon people not knowing who you are, like at a convention. And seeing people actually play it is just like usually a highlight. Although one time <laughs> I walked up and I saw people reading the rule book to a game, and I asked, uh, "Oh, do you want any help? I could I could teach it." And and the one person reading the rules was farther away from me, and the person closer said, "Oh, don't worry about it. this game. Looks horrible." <laughs> 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 and I was just kind of like, okay, cool. And I walked away and then I heard like a murmur. And then I definitely think like they had figured out like, oh shoot, like that was <laughs> <laughs> So talking, so moving on now to the future, what do you have coming out in the future that we can, we can play from? Yeah. Uh, well, I'm really excited. Uh, Arcane Wonders is, uh has a game where i've co-designed it with wolfgang kramer and it's a remake of an old uh game i'm butchering how you say it but ox Assel, uh which was a trucking game and we've reimagined it into this really beautiful cute like running through the celtic uh forest called ley lines and so i'm really excited about ley lines uh getting out there the hope is by you know end of the year uh, Sagrada Artisans uh, should be coming out this year. It was kickstarted last year, and so I'm really excited about about that. I have a, a game with Elf Creek uh, about beavers that I'm really excited about coming. Um, don't know when that will come out. Mistwind is a pickup and delivery game that Adrian Adamescu, who I co-designed uh, Sagrada with, 
Uh, we have that coming to Kickstarter with a smaller game company called uh, First Fish Games. And we're really excited because the art is incredible. We have these cool little whale miniatures that are like flying around and picking up and delivering. Um, got some games for 25th Century Games that I'm excited about. Um, yeah, there's there's a few on the horizon. It's like another one of those kind of groundswell moments where I've been working on a bunch and then over COVID there were delays and now they're starting to, to trickle out. So you've worked with Wolfgang Kramer, who's as close to being a living legend in the game industry as anybody. When working with him, when working with him, did you see why his games are so good? Oh, I mean, he is just brilliant. I, I've had the pleasure of of meeting him a couple times but even just emails or interactions he's he's graceful and thoughtful and wise i mean i just i it is no surprise to me that he is able to create meaningful moments and that are thoughtful like it just like now knowing him it only reiterates like oh that's why he's a star is that he is just a, a complete gentleman and, and a brilliant, kind, generous other, you know, a, a world citizen. And so he holds his ideas, but he does not hold them too firmly. He is flexible and uh, open minded. And I just think like that has gone a long way to obviously his success, but also what I learned from him and try to hopefully model. So when you're working on a project, do you ever know it's going to be a success or are you always surprised? Um, I think I'm always surprised. I know, I think I know when something has a chance, but even Sagrada, Sagrada I pitched and seven different companies uh, took it for consideration and then returned it. So like beyond, I pitched it to a whole ton of companies and then I kept thinking, oh, we're on to something and then nope. And so like that whole process got me to the point that I think by the time we signed it, yes, I was excited, but I was like, eh, you know, if that many companies decided like, you know what, we're going to give this back. I, you know, I didn't think that was going to be a hit and I thought it could do good and I liked it. I hoped it would do well enough that we could make some expansions for it. We had a bunch of ideas, but that just kind of shows me there's still like a decent amount of luck <laughs> involved. I think the funniest part is I think I'm better at identifying successes for other people's designs than I am on my own. So I have done for a few companies, uh, inventor relations and been pretty great at identifying, you know, successful games for them. And even, um, you know, I had a game company, Maple, for a very short amount of time, thought I not only made a couple of cool games, but the games that we had signed that ended up going to elsewhere have been hits. Anything from like Mind Management was a game that we picked and developed or uh, games like Sandcastles that Brotherwise did. Like these are all uh, games that that I signed a while ago and identified and saw like greatness in them. And, uh, and it was kind of nice to see that they worked out sad that, you know, it didn't work out together, but, but loved cheering on the success from those inventors. So I think, I think it's real, it's hard when you're so close to something to know, uh, kind of the, the upside. I'm a, I'm probably a little bit more brutal or, or, or concrete on designs by others. <laughs> So two more questions then. So firstly, you're you're at a convention and in the evening you go to the pub and you're on the way back from the loo and you there's a table of gamers and you hear your name mentioned. So you sidle into the corner and you eavesdrop on their conversation. What do you hope they're saying about you? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I hope it's good. Uh, uh, I, you know, ultimately, uh, A, I'd like you know, them to speak highly of my character and uh, me as a person. And, and also, uh, you know, as a professional, I hope that people recognize and respect my talents and uh, think I'm someone good to work with and uh, put out things that 
create fun. Uh, I, I hope people see me as someone that's lifting others up, that I'm inclusive and, and fighting for, you know, us to get better as a, as an industry and, and keep kind of challenging myself. So those would be the things I'd hope I'd over here. We'll see. So my last question then, why is gaming good? Oh, that's a, that's a fun question. Actually. I like that to think that games are meaningful because it's bringing us face to face with each other. It's, it's, it's bringing us to a shared table. And so this is only going to make the world a better place when we're able to, you know, spend time together, solve problems together, have fun together. There's something really special. I think about how games slow us down, um, uh, create laugh, create, you know, tensions that we have to solve even competing or attacking each other, but getting it out there where we can, you know, persist, but be resilient, you know, where we can, uh, have fun, but have disagreements and still like at the end of a game, like get up and still be friends. And so I think games are really necessary. I think, uh, I'm thankful that I can be part of an industry that brings people joy, that, uh, gives people escape from the tough times. And, uh, and even I think as an industry, we're maturing and finding even more interesting stories to tell and more interesting or complex experiences. So as we broaden and explore and experiment with even just different ideas beyond just, you know, quote unquote, laughs and fun and party, but other things that we can do together and use a game as an excuse to be connected. Um, yeah, I think that's why games are good. Excellent. Well, Daryl Andrews, thank you very much. Ah, thank you.